Buonasera a tutti, sono Lucano Strambini, del ricercatore dell'Istituto di eh, Ingegneria Elettronica e Ingegneria dell'Informazione e delle Telecomunicazioni. Eh, sto facendo le veci del nostro direttore Paolo Ravazzani che è impegnato in un'altra un conferenza e, e ringrazio tutti i partecipanti per essere presenti questa sera a questa ulteriore serata del seminario degli incontri del giovedì in cui abbiamo il piacere di avere l'ingegnere Sara Mugnaini di OneWeb che eh, ci fornirà un interessante contributo sulla tecnologia satellitare Leo eh, sviluppata eh, da OneWeb e tutto quello che diciamo, da questo ne può trarre come vantaggio per i futuri sviluppi de della rete e delle comunicazioni. E non voglio rubare altro tempo sia alla relatrice che a, a Giuseppe Virone, che è il mio collega eh, IT, che introdurrà appunto la, la, la speaker. Vi solo, eh, ricordo soltanto che eh, la, il seminario sarà registrato e successivamente sarà pubblicato sul canale YouTube del nostro istituto, per cui eh, per questione di privacy, se qualcuno non vuole essere eh, presente nella registrazione, vi invito a togliere eh, il video e comunque sia e farvi presente di questa, di questa diciamo, evenienza. Eh, non perdo altro tempo, ringrazio lo speaker e lascio la parola a Giuseppe Virone per l'introduzione. Buona serata a tutti. Grazie Lucano per for, for, for questa serie di seminari. Uh, this uh, seminar is organized in the framework of uh, the Restart uh, project uh, um, for the SPOC2 uh, Integrated Terrestrial and Non-Terrestrial Networks. And it, it also, we also invited many students of the Antera project, which is a Marie Curie network that is specific uh, oriented on antenna design for, for Leo Constellation. I will now introduce the speaker. So, Sara Mugnaini uh, got her Master uh, in Telecommunication Engineering and PhD in Applied Electromagnetics for, from the University of Pisa. Uh, she started working on antennas and, and telecommunication payloads at Airbus Defense and then yeah. Imarsat. Um, and then, more recently, uh, she joined um, OneWeb uh, at, at first as, as a principal engineer for, on, on payloads. But now uh, she's leading the advanced technology roadmap for both the ground, seg ground and space segment. So thanks again, Sara, for, for joining for the seminar and please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hi, Amir, thanks for the introduction. Thank you, uh, Giuseppe, for inviting me. I'm happy to be here and share some information about when, where, what we do and what um, what we are and uh, thank you to everyone that is connected. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I am, I, I am an antenna engineer myself uh, by um, studies uh, and by experience. Uh, I've started my career in, in the space uh, industry as an antenna designer for, um, for space application. Uh, and uh, now I'm putting that experience that I have in design and, and, and development of antennas, a big in the bigger picture of um, developing and finding, finding and developing and, and validating uh, RF, generic, in generical uh, RF technologies for future generation of uh, in space and on ground um, technologies for, for um, for LEO constellation, but generically for LEO satellites. Um, today, I'll uh, speak a bit about OneWeb, uh, an introduction of what we do and what we are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what is innovation for us and what we do, uh, talk about the constellation that we have today, the, the high volume manufacturing, uh, talk about the Sunrise project, which is our highlight of the year, basically. Um, I'll talk about demo labs, onboard antennas, gateway antennas, and user terminal antennas as the three main, the three key technology that we are looking into for um, allowing up to us to leap into the future um, of communication. Um, and then talk about what future beholds and a few questions uh, if you have any at the end. So this is the purpose of OneWeb, connect, connection everywhere changes everything um, and it's nothing more than a fancy way to say that we are aiming at connecting 
um, all the globe um, to have global connectivity. Now, global connectivity is a bit of a chimera, is a sacred growl of all satcom companies at the moment, um, and especially for Leo. But unlike some other Leo that actually uh, they are there uh, in the marketplace now, OneWeb prioritize um, the coverage bit of our um, purpose uh, in the choices that he made at, at the base of the design of, of, of the constellation. Um, it's it's a truly global, global connect connectivity that we are offering, and um, we are aiming to keep doing that. Um, and this impact in impacted in the in the decision uh, in the old uh, in the design that we did for Gen two and for Gen one, and we will impact in the decision that we do for Gen for Gen two for the future generation. Um, um, so OneWeb as at the moment now that we are a, a, a real company. Uh, a real end-to-end -end global system that can connect from every place on earth. The constellation is now complete and the network is in the final phase of the deployment to deliver connectivity everywhere and enabling low latency, high speed internet everywhere. And what brought us here is a good deal of innovation to accelerate the development because if you can do a satellite geo uh, with old space you cannot do a constellation with old space it will be it will be just not feasible at all so we have to really accelerate and change the paradigm of what building for space meant in the last at least um, five to eight years um, and we aim to be really um, anchored to Europe as the industrial ecosystem that support the development of OneWeb. As we are not in a EU in EU anymore, but we are geographically in Europe, and we are about to merge with Utelsat, which is a great satellite entity in EU, in continental Europe, and we aim to be a European. Um, constellation at all. Okay. We are a fully funded company at the moment. OneWeb is fully funded, uh, no debt. There are partners coming from all across the world. Uh, and um, as you may know, uh, OneWeb, uh, a bit, a, a little bit like Phoenix got bursted into at the beginning of 2020, just the beginning of COVID, for then being resurrected six months after that um, by a, a new investor that pushed new life into the project, believed in it, and made uh, made it to becoming a real company uh, and, and a real Leo constellation. Uh, a bit of uh, numbers for uh, the constellation that we have in orbit. We have executed 19 launches, which are um, the, the full amount of launches that we need to do uh, with three different launchers. We have 635 satellites in orbit and we are planning to have 45 gateways. They are not all completed, but uh, uh, most of them um, are and the other are being uh, constructed at the moment. Um, why L Leo is expected to, re uh, to revolutionize SATCOM? It's because it unlocks use cases that satellite communication before uh, didn't even think about trying to attack and trying to, uh, uh, to, to, to fulfill um, because of the latency. So satellite communication up to just very little amount of years ago was just Leo connectivity and that is weighted down by a very high level of latency which is above 560 milliseconds which <clears throat> basically um, not, is not allowing any sort of real, real time uh, voice or video interactive way of communication um, 
And if we go from that 500 to a, a mere 50 millisecond, that changes everything in terms of the application that you can run on it. Apart from the voice and video and, and the, the, the video communication, there is awful lot of um, business um, um, use cases that benefit from being able to connect everywhere with that latency, which can be from uh, real live trading to the much more um, trivial gaming, but there is awful lot of stuff in the middle that um, it's really important and brings business. So Leo is shifting what can go on satellite to what was before when Geo was the only option. Um, what are we bringing to the Leo market? What one web is bringing is the priority of priority of spectrum. So the spectrum in KU and KA that, that one web has as priority over any other Leo uh, constellation. So every other Leo constellation works in KU and KA has to not interfere with us. Why we can go more or less whatever we want that what that means. And we have built up a a satellite manufacturing factory just for us. We launch, we did 19 launches, one web launches 19 launchers with 600 odd satellite on it. And in some period of time, we add a cadence of one launch per month, which if you think about old space, it's a crazy amount of launch launches to pile up and 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 do because every launch re require a preparation in advance um, and it's an incredible rhythm to get that um, monthly. Um, we have now a full constellation, we are ready uh, with all the um, commercial infrastructure so we will become a reality. Uh, one way will become a reality in the in in this in, in the satellite industry. Uh, this, the, the, the constellation itself is designed with new technologies, but the main, the most important thing is that this technology are um, all tested uh, and built to be full tolerant and tested before launch because what we are we don't want to do what one web doesn't want to do is sell m m sending more junk in space there is a lot of junk in space we know that this is uh, a big problem uh, that is coming to uh, the news even more often um, and OneWeb embraces a live no trace philosophy in its design and in the operation of its constellation. OneWeb is leader in responsible space, uh, both in uh, the perspective of space waste and also in the perspective of both radio and light pollution. Uh, and maybe we can talk about that uh, later in the presentation, but uh, there has been um, steps done towards uh, being more green in this sense, uh, which are very concrete uh, and very useful for the community as well. What are the technical advantages now that we, we look deeper into what a LEO satellite means, what are the advantages of a LEO constellation with respect to a, me, a, geo, a geo satellite, for example? Um, so as I, I said before, which is part of our uh, purpose as well, we, we, are, we are global because we can be global. LEO, LEO constellation comes almost naturally as a global coverage um, constellation if you made the choice of having your um, orbits to do so. Um, and uh, the, the one web orbits are polar so that we naturally cover the whole globe. 
but we are also very, very close to Earth with respect to what a geosatellite is. Um, a LEO satellite is about from 400 to 1400. Uh, one web satellite are at 1200 and that is a lot less um, path loss with respect to our geo satellite. The path loss between geo and LEO, the difference in path loss is about 30 dB. Consider what you can do with 30 dB. That allows both the satellite and the user terminal on ground to be a lot smaller. And that helps both in the design of this of the space part and also in the um, in the design of the ground and the mobility that you can achieve with a smaller satellite with a smaller uh, user terminal um, and also the satellite a leo satellite is all, always moving in the sky which means that on one side it makes more complex the reception of the signal because you have to move the user terminal physically or electronically all the time, but also means that in, in average, my elevation, my, the, the, the elevation from ground that I can look at the satellite is high. Most of the time I can see the satellite at a good angle. Also means that if I am in front of a tree um, and I my geo is just in that direction where the tree is, I cannot see the geo all the time, but if I am connected with a Leo, yeah, I cannot see the Leo now, but in five seconds I will, uh, which makes mobility uh, generically a lot easier. And also there is the, or the already talked about low latency, which unlock different usage of the, of the satellite, uh, of the connection. Um, so we, one web launch satellite in batches. This is the, the dispenser that was designed to, uh, to um, host the satellite connected to the dispenser that are then um, getting separated when in space. Uh, the launch can host from a minimum of 36 satellites to a maximum of 40 ish. Uh, in this video you can see two satellites at the edges of this in the middle is, um, is a dummy weight that was put there because this was the first launch that OneWeb did in 2019. And here you can see the separation of the satellite from the dispenser um, and the satellite happily drifted into space and then when at a certain distance it will ignite and get in the position that it's supposed to, to have. And this is the satellite. The um, Leo OneWeb satellite is a small satellite. It's about 150 kilos in the dimension of a washing machine, maybe a professional one, not a very one that you have in your house, but very similar. Um, and is a concentrate of technology that was never applied before in space. Um, the, the, the user antenna is the one on the front, the weird one with the weird angles. Um, they are arrays, they are um, fixed beams arrays, uh, which span across the surface. Um, they are um, linear arrays, so the beam that they create is um, oblong in one direction and thin in the other uh, and create like a, a blanket of coverage that then moves around across the earth. Um, while the antennas on the top are the gateway antenna, the, there are two gateways antenna that connect to the ground station on ground and um, they operate in a one on and the other one back up and they exchange when they end over to a different um, ground station. Um, this is the blanketed coverage that I was talking about before. As you can see, the global edge is full and is designed to bear to touch basically at the uh, at the at the equator, which is our most difficult um, area to cover for us. And they overlap uh, at the polar 
um, region um, and the capacity is, is distributed equally across um, all the old surface. Um, and when a user terminal is somewhere on ground, the satellite is moving across uh, and the user terminal need to switch frequency and connect one beam of, uh, after the other as the satellite move and keep tracking. So the connection from the ground perspective, it's obviously a bit more complicated, more complex than what you would expect for a geosatellite in which I have a point, um, my satellite is static there in the sky, I point my antenna, it will take a, a bit to center it perfectly and then you leave it and it's going to stay there for a long time. Uh, this is completely different, it's a completely different concept and completely different technology involved, even from the perspective of um, a user terminal. And that's why um, LEO technology, not only in space, but also on ground, is driving innovation uh, in this perspective. But the true, let's say, the, the, the true innovation, or the major innovation that uh, this generation of one uh, web uh, satellites brought in the space ecosystem. It's not as much in the satellite is itself uh, as in the manufacturing of it. Um, so OneWeb and Airbus have a joint venture, it's called OneWeb Satellite, and they built up a factory in, uh, in, in Cape Canaveral, Florida. And these plant is really um, different from what you would commonly see in a, in a manufacturer of the old space community as it's called, but yeah, the major, the, all the primes that you can think about from, from a space perspective. It is very different. It is built to, to pull out two satellites per day. If you consider that for one geosatellite, it takes two years more or less to integrate a single satellite and a LEO satellite is out of the uh, assembly line in one day and not alone. So there is like a, a shift in, in what is satellite manufacturing to be able, there must be a shift to be able to do that, to reduce a billion times the, the integration of, of uh, space equipment to make it um, this fast. And this is what was done in, in, in the, so this is a small clip of what the factory looked like. There is a lot of robotic involved, but the major, uh, let's say, innovation is that the satellite is truly designed for manufacturing. So if you think about the fact that you have to send out, so the, 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 the single subsystem are built uh, uh, by the partners, by the, the, the suppliers and stored at the factory. And then every um, subsystem is integrated and then the satellite is integrated in one day. And um, what happened is that the design need to be um, done for doing that, really. Uh, if you consider that you have something like hundreds of connectors in there, and if you consider a single SMA connector and how long does it take to connect a connector and check the connection, you soon realize that you cannot really do that in if you want to push out a satellite in one day or two days with testing. Um, so, Every single connector in, in the design was designed to be like click and connect. So you just click it and you're sure you don't need to check it. Um, and also all the, all the, the, the every subsystem is mounted at a different station. Every subsystem as a station and that station is computer controlled. 
So person is doing it, but the computer knows what the person should do. And so if the person is going with his, with his drilling hand and is going to a place that is not the place the computer is, is expecting for the operation that the user is, is doing at, at that moment, the computer will will sound an alarm or a sort of alert and saying, I noticed that you're not doing what's in the procedure. And this is because we cannot afford to make any mistake because the mistakes then require more time to be discovered and, and checked and uh, and um, and corrected. So it's sort of everything is optimized for not being prone to mistakes. Like if you think about you have to close a box with uh, with a lead and the lead has symmetric holes. In any way you put this lead, the holes will will end up in the same place. So you won't notice if your lead is in is in the right uh, direction or is upside down. But if you do the the holes in the lead in an asymmetric way, you will notice if you have put your lead upside down. Things like these were really put into the design of the of of the satellite to make it um, as error proof as possible, let's say. And then there is the testing and the testing is really important because we are committing to sending in space only things that works and it's not junk. Uh, so it is. Under percent of the satellite that comes out of the factory are tested, um, but testing is expensive and it takes time. So what was um, put together is a, a way to store, for example, the pa sonar panel on, on the outside so that in one way you can do an end to end test from the solar panel, giving the power to the satellite to the antenna uh, on the top. Um, uh, transmitting. Um, so with one go and one simple check, you see all the subsystems um, that are working and you can send the satellite out of the um, of the um, factory uh, at the right time. Uh, we are also uh, uh, um, finished building all our control um, and operation and control uh, centers in London. So the constellation is more or less everything is is on the way to go. Uh, and OneWeb has service from 35 degree north almost everywhere at the moment and will be global service global in uh, in in at the end of the, the year, probably um, December 2023. So what happened now? Where do we go? Do we stay? Um, when this business staying still means um, going back, it's very steep business. So we have to go ahead. Uh, what do we? Where do we go? So finish. Having just barely finished the the generation one of the constellation, one web is already uh, thinking about generation two. And focusing on a few key technologies, and at the center of this key technology, there is there are antennas, because obviously the payload is what pays for the satellite. The, the platform is important, but it's not paying any. It's not giving any service. It's not paying. It's not. It, it's not coming with a bill. Um, and uh, and so. In the key technology, there is sh certainly the need for the next generation to be as more reconfigurable as possible. So we are aiming to have a reconfigurable payload on board. So a flexible payload coupled with a multi-beam phase array that will make sure that the utilization of the capacity available is much more flexible and we and it's possible to move it instead of having the blanket capacity like Gen 1 has. Um, so it has to be multi beam, it has to be uh, fast switching, it has to be interconnected with optical 
uh, if needed. It is very important that we have this, we add this layer of uh, flexibility on top of the global capacity. Um, and then antennas are not only on the satellite, are uh, um, on the ground as well, uh, both with the user at the user terminal side uh, and at the ground um, station side. And then we have to make sure as well that we take in consideration the fact that the world is becoming 5G connected. So if we can um, make sure that the, the services, the high level stack services of 5G can work with all of the complexity of the of the multi beam flexible beam hoppy capacity uh, then we make sure that we can use um, the satellite network to do ground network backhauling as well which is very important for some places like australia in which for example remote connectivity is most of the connectivity um, and the target of this roadmap uh, that we have towards the next generation is obviously achieving higher flexibility, a lower cost per bit, and even lower <coughs> latency. The one that we have. Um, so how do we make sure we get there? Um, we have one web as a network, as a sat as a of satellites have a factory <laughs> and um, as the possibility to launch, build and launch satellite. Um, and if we can demonstrate technology in space, the evolution and the development is a lot faster. So we are, OneWeb is positioned very well to demonstrate the technology that will be key in the future generation in space. And a key example of this is the Sunrise JoySat demonstration mission was developed in the framework of the Sunrise Partnership in cooperation with partners, UK Space Agency and the European Space Agency that brings together a lot of technology, demonstrator, put it on satellite and send it into space to, to test. So we go, we can go this quick loop, loop between new space technology, so technology that doesn't have a lot of um, heritage, flight heritage or, or none at all, that is mutated from automotive market or other lower cost market and, and put it in space and try out so that you can understand what's the level of extra um, effort that you have to put in it. For example, um, radiation hardening. It's not necessarily true that you cannot use um, automotive electronics in space. It depends a bit where you put it in the satellite, what level of hardening you do. And if you can try these things out, you can save, save a lot of money. And if you save a lot of money on one satellite and then you build up a constellation on it, you save a lot of money on, um, on, on all, uh, a, a very big amount of money. Um, so yeah, the, the idea is trying um, in space as much technology as possible. Um, and the first of this, uh, trial in space is called JoySat. It's called JoySat because the main thing that is going to taste uh, test is beam hopping. So the capability to spread the capacity um, across different beam by basically having TDM in space. Uh, and JoySat is the cub uh, of um, um, Kangaroo. So JoySat is a jumping satellite, more or less. Um, and JoySat, what there is on JoySat, there is a new digital payload that was developed by other, our partner Satix, Satix5, which is fully regenerative, fully digital, and enabled beam hopping. 
um, we have a radiation monitor because it's very important to us to understand radiation. There is not a lot of information. There is not a lot of data on radiation at Leo. And we need to understand better how radiation works in space to not over complicate what we put on satellites. Um, and then there are a few different other um, bits that we are going to try, some ancillary payloads uh, to demonstrate some services um, at the right altitude. We are trying to, we, we, we are trying some technology for reducing harnessing, reducing cabling, so like wireless connections, because cabling is a lot of weight. Uh, cabling, only cabling on a satellite can be up to uh, on a big satellite can be up to 150 kilos. On the small one web satellite is still not negligible. Um, a few tenths of kilos. So it's important to get rid of it as much as possible. And then solar cells, we are trying new solar cells, but this is not the only um, thing that we are trying with Joyce at. There is a ground part to it as well. Uh, we are a partner with Celestia UK, which is a ground technology company in the in here in um, in Scotland. Uh, that is creating a multi beam ground antenna. Uh, it's the first of its uh, species, and we are going to test it with Joysat. Um, satisfy on top of uh, the um, the payload is working on user terminals as well. And with the University of Surrey, we are doing trials on um, how the 5G uh, higher uh, stack levels <clears throat> can be um, working on um, an infrastructure of a satellite constellation network. But this is not all that was developed in the framework of the Sunrise Partnership, there is more to it. Uh, Sunrise is much um, in uh, a work in progress. I'll show this little video with Sunrise, all the projects that are part of this partnership. Five, four, you can three, hear it. two, one, and just hold power. And liftoff of Falcon 9. Go Falcon, go OneWeb 2. In 2019, OneWeb successfully launched its first ever cluster of low Earth orbit communication satellites. This year, our constellation will complete to provide connectivity to governments, industries, and communities in the remotest locations worldwide. For those caught up in the digital divide, this innovative technology can enable access to high-speed, low-latency broadband. The OneWeb story, however, is one of connectivity and beyond. OneWeb's rapid progress has been a catalyst for exciting new innovation. We are proud to be part of the Sunrise program working with the UK and European space agencies and many renowned partners. Together, we are developing a new space-based ecosystem and futuristic technologies that will help increase flexibility and improve our network service. Our launches provide partners with unique research opportunities. A satellite we call JoeySat will carry their technologies into orbit for validation and testing. Satisfy is developing technology to improve how we manage capacity. Demand for data rises and falls, and the UK company's new beam hopping system can be continuously resized and realigned, directing data to where it is needed most. Seen here undergoing a vibration test, this groundbreaking technology will spread data more responsively. We can increase capacity when demand surges in hard to reach places. Satisfy is also working on the ground, building a software driven user terminal that is compact, has no moving parts and can lock onto and receive data more flexibly. 
Together, we're also working on mobile solutions, including an aviation terminal for large aircraft that will give a home-like broadband experience in mid-air. A new dawn for in-flight communications. For data to travel up to our satellite system more effectively, OneWeb has partnered with Celestia UK. Celestia is developing a prototype gateway antenna, which will create and steer multiple beams to our constellation, allowing tens of satellites to connect to our network through a single link. This will dramatically reduce the cost of capacity, the latency of our network and the footprint of our ground stations. The great advantage of our low Earth orbit constellation is that we can send connectivity to anywhere on the planet. But what if there is no local infrastructure? UK-based Prolectric excels at remote solar power generation and is developing a fully autonomous power platform equipped with a compact OneWeb user terminal. It can be deployed in extreme locations and is suitable for hostile environments and disaster situations. In parallel, OneWeb is working on its own fully transportable gateway, deployable as a backup solution in a matter of days to deliver high throughput connectivity. Some of our partners are exploring the not so obvious yet still hugely valuable capabilities of our system. ACO is using artificial intelligence to analyze and learn from the vast amounts of system data we generate. We are pioneering machine learning for the future of satellite operations in space and want to better understand component life cycles and how they age. Satellite Applications Catapult is looking into the positioning data of our satellites. We want to build an independent, UK-specific positioning system similar and complementary to GPS. Researchers at Surrey University are studying how our low Earth orbit data beams can carry 5G connectivity for the ever-growing number of devices that demand internet access. And we are working on projects to harness the spare capacity that our satellites carry between each of the main beams and use it for the benefit of Internet of Things applications. Picture microbeams that can connect with remote sensors and environmental monitors worldwide. Astroscale and OneWeb share a commitment to responsible space. Through Sunrise, Astroscale is developing spacecraft capable of retrieving and deorbiting our satellites. We can control how, where and when they return to Earth using specially designed docking stations that can be used if required. Monitors fitted to JoeySat will measure radiation in the space environment where we fly. This data will help optimize and better protect our fleets, as well as inform the scientific community. The renowned Italian engineering company, Chasey, excels in building lighter, more efficient solar arrays so satellites can have a more robust power supply at lower cost. Put together, Sunrise is a partnership. We are driving innovation that future generations will need if we are to meet the global challenges our planet must face. We are creating technology that is cheaper reduces light and radio frequency pollution and enables a more flexible system with higher throughput and lower latency for an improved user experience. Satellites that work for longer will be serviced in space and eventually decommissioned to leave no trace. And best of all, we have the opportunity to do this through collaboration. In pursuit of space as a natural shared resource, which if used responsibly, can transform the way we live. OneWeb and our partners are changing the nature of communications on Earth. Yeah, <clears throat> going back. Um, so this is like description of what all the projects are part of the of the Sunrise project. Uh, if you go back a little bit more onto the JoySat mission and we look about a bit more in details, we can say that it is 
it's built up on a platform which is the Gen 1 platform, but it's been stripped off of all the payload inside and equipped with the digital uh, beamformer and the two antenna pa um, panels, one in TX and one in RX. Um, and yeah, all the payload inside is new and is all prototype. Um, has been launched uh, in, as in May 2023, a few, a couple of months ago. Uh, is currently orbit raising, but all the system has, be, has been switched on and functioning, and the radiation monitor is already, already collecting data. So we are um, happy of what uh, we have achieved with this demo satellite, which is the first, but will definitely be the first of um, many. Um, we will test the antenna, the beam hope, we will test the beam forming capability of the antenna in space. We will test the beam hopping capability of the antenna in space. Uh, forming beam on, beams on the ground, then we will have four different locations on the ground with, with different user terminal, different in terms of um, models as well. Um, and also we will test the satellite in space with the prototype ground station, multi-beam ground station on the ground in late 2023, may, maybe early 2024. And we will do a 5G service demo as well on top of the end-to-end -end communication of uh, JoySat in space. So it's, it's really an end-to-end -end system which will be tested in space and something like this is not happening all the time um, in, develop, in developing a technology for space. So it's really truly innov innovative in this. On top of Sunrise, we built internal demo labs as well, um, especially for antenna, especially for UTs. We are relying on partners, but we are doing our own research as well and our own um, development. Uh, there, we have two labs, one located in Toulouse, France, and one in London, here in London. Mm. Uh, and from this demo lab, we will design the future demo mission that we will launch um, for developing and accelerating the new technology, especially in the antenna field. Um, these are the area of interest that we are discussing uh, and um, looking at in the demo lab. But let's say let's go a little bit deeper into everything that is antenna, mostly because that's what I do is what I like. Um, so why we we want to go into onboard and, uh, antennas which are dynamic because we have the global capability, the, the global coverage coming from the generation one. So we don't need to be global anymore with generation two. We have the backup. What we need to do with the future generation is putting the capacity where there are hotspots, where there are needs and moving the capacity across as it moves and the traffic moves. And if you can do that, you can schedule capacity allocation follow, for example, peak hours moving across the time, the time zone or you can allocate capacity to where there was no traffic before. If you think about Dubai uh, 20 years ago, there was probably 500k people and now there are 3 million. So with this system, with a, a flexible system, you can move capacity when it's needed and you need to, to book for that in advance. And you can follow the traffic, like for example, if you, take a, if you think about aero traffic, and why Leo makes a Leo satellite makes sense to to have this on board, mostly because it's closer to ground. So I can do with an antenna which is fairly small, as you could see from the picture of um, JoySat, um, and you don't need a reflector, so the satellite can stay small, and I can pack them up really, really close in a launcher, a lot of them. In a geo, you can, you need a lot more dBs to do this. Um, and it doesn't, they don't come for free, they don't come for cheap, and they don't come um, in no space. So Leo is the perfect platform 
for allowing this sort of innovation in space. Um, there are challenges, obviously. Um, if you pack a lot of antennas, fairly big for what big means in a Leo environment, in a very in a small place of a small um, platform, you have obviously every sort of neutral coupling that you can think of. Uh, interference, you want to pack as much capacity as possible in a small amount of space, which brings up dual polarization problems, uh, power consumption, thermal dissipation. So there are challenges and and the the target is to address all these challenges and come up with a solution that works. And we're working towards them in our demo lab and in the sunrise um, demonstrations. Um, and the other interesting uh, antennas that we have is the ground one. The traditional approach to ground station is the one in which you get a big field as far away from civilization as you can and you pack it with a lot of antenna. Every antenna is pointing to one satellite, uh, which means that for a LEO um, ground station you have some way around between uh, 15 and 30 antennas per field, uh, continuously moving and tracking. It's a geo-derived geo approach. So in geo, this is the ground station because in geo you only need one antenna to connect to a geo. So you put it somewhere far away that don't, don't disturb anybody, you point it and you forget about it for years. In, in Leo, the approach is this because up to now um, it's a novelty. So nobody really do, did anything about solving these issues. Um, but in Leo makes makes sense to do something about it because a Leo satellite is again closer to Earth, so the antennas itself are a lot smaller. So if I want to connect to a geo satellite with a phase array on the ground uh, at the power needed for a gateway, I need a very big one. But if I am in, in Leo, I only need to cover 1200 kilometers. I can do it with a fairly reasonable size. So multi-beam antenna for ground, like phase array type of antenna, a bit more evolved than a single flat antenna, but the concept is that made a lot make a lot more sense in Leo than in Geo. Also, they are static, they don't move, so they don't need to continuously track mechanically, which means that I don't have to complex maintenance operation that I need to do on my mechanical antenna because it's tracking 24-7 for months. And this is time and cost. And then also the ground station for Leo are a lot bigger, so I need to find big spaces. And now I find it far away from the cities because there is cheap and I don't disturb anybody. But that also means that to go to the core network, it, it takes some time. So I'm adding latency and my key asset is the latency. So if I'm adding latency, I'm not doing myself a favor. I want to be closer to the core network so that my latency is even more reduced because that is my asset. So in, in Leo makes sense to have one antenna with 15 beams which I can put on top of a building in London instead of having 30 antenna because you need spares as well in a field in the middle of Norway. So again, the change, the shift from geo to Leo is driving innovation in, in field that didn't need to be innovated before. Um, obviously, even here there are challenges. The main one is the power. The main ones are power and bandwidth because a bandwidth in a gateway is at least two gigahertz instantaneous and it's not very easy as antenna designer here may know. Design an antenna which handle a lot of power and has an instantaneous bandwidth tip of two gigahertz at KU. A KA, sorry. Um, so yeah, it's not easy, but it's definitely feasible, and we are hoping to demonstrate that very soon with Joyce up um, and um, our ground station. And the last bit, but the one that it's 
obviously getting a lot of attention recently is the user terminal because we have seen this shift um, from the current, the, the usual uh, SATCOM uh, antennas, which are reflected in a big dome, to more compact, flat user terminal. Again, the, 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 the reflector dome are geo-derived. It's a geo-derived approach. Geo used to have that. Didn't need to have much more than that. Um, and they are still good for enterprise use. They are uh, use, well suited for maritime, well suited for large enterprise, well suited for extreme temperature, remote use, but they are not well suited for a mobility application, for, for example, because they're big and heavy and you cannot go around in a car with a reflector on the top. They are single beam as well, so you, you need to have two of them to to end over with satellites and you need professional installation. In this, uh, um, a Leo constellation is a, again driving innovation because I can do smaller again. I need fast switching to connect to Leo satellite in a in, a, in the good way of doing it. And an electronic steerable flat panel can instantaneously almost switching. Uh, and ensure continuous service with only one antenna instead of two. Um, and also my elevation is most of the time good and I am not affected by blockage that we said before and the advantages of LEO. So it makes a lot of sense um, to, to go from parabolic antennas to flat panel antennas for LEO and that is why we are seeing now that the Leo constellation are gaining weight in the space ecosystem. We are seeing this enormous interest in uh, developing flat panel, electronically steerable antenna. Everyone is jumping at the, a lot of companies are jumping at the, at, at, on this project and, and trying to do their own um, antenna. But, there are still challenges here as well. Obviously, if you look at the power efficiency of, of a phase array, um, uh, analog beamforming is, is not the best. Digital beamforming is even worse. Um, and compare with the, the mechanical, the, the power consumption of a, um, of a motor um, is not very, it's not very appealing. Um, also the form factor, um, the aperture efficiency of a phase array is still not ideal, which gives panels which are, yes, flat, but also quite big. Um, so they're not fit there in the, the idea, that romantic idea that the market has of having a very small thing on top of your car and you drive around and you are connected. So we need to get there in terms of um, aperture efficiency. We need obviously to drive the cost down, um, ensuring that the fast tracking is in line with the need of a Leo constellation. And then obviously um, multi-beam capability is a plus because it will allow you to have multiple services. You could, you could connect to more than one satellite and increase your capacity or having two services on one antenna, on one on the user terminal. So that that's definitely the future. Um, and on our side, we will continue innovation in space driven by the fact that we can demonstrate and, and accelerate technology by sending them to space as soon as possible and on ground driven by the market and the possibility that we have to test everything in an existing demonstrated and operational infrastructure that we now have. So we are offering a good way of accelerating technology to everyone. And that's it. I hope it was interesting. Thank you, Sarah. It was really interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Tess, for the very nice. You covered a lot of aspects. And uh, so I think we can now open a QA session if uh, anybody wants to ask a question. Just raise your hand or just speak up. It's fine. Okay. One for Professor Nepa. 
if you know very well. You may know, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Sara. <laughs> Hi. Nice to see you. Hi. Hi. First of all, uh, thanks a lot for your very clear presentation. You have been able in less than one hour to focalize the attention on the main challenges, the main applications, uh, the the best results uh, OneWeb got in, during this during last years. Also, I want to congratulate you for uh, your career as antenna designer. I still remember when you were around the, our uh, department during your PhD studies, Samia Selu. And uh, then I have a couple mm -hmm. of questions for you. Uh, first of all, what is a curiosity? What is the lifetime of a satellite? One well satellite and the other uh, question is a tricky question. Uh, in, in your op opinion, opinion, as far as you know, uh, what is the most promising technology for user uh, user uh, antenna, uh, terminal antenna, flat <clears throat> antennas? Okay. A way um, guide the technology, print the technology. Can you? Can you suggest us <laughs> the, the right technology, please? <laughs> Maybe you have already seen some antennas from uh, companies that are suggesting solutions. Um, yeah, so from the first question, so the lifetime of uh, LEO satellite, our first generation is seven years. It was designed to be um, a bit less, but we have data now and we are confident that it's going to last up to seven years. So we are counting that in the, the operation. Um, usually, I would say that a generate um, like a, a constellation is aiming to five to seven, no more than that. Uh, because as if you want to elongate your life too much, then the cost is spiraling. The cost of the of, of the equipment is spiraling and going out of the target that you want to achieve. Mm. So seven is really the top. Um, as long as regard that the technology, I mean, there are different applications, different needs. Um, there has been recently a lot of interest in passive uh, sort of beam forming because that is driving the power a lot down uh, instead of like uh, analog beam forming phase array, which are on from 100 watt to 300 watts looking. There are applications they are looking at powers that are below 50 watts and you can only achieve it with passive beam forming, um, which can be any kind of really um, by lenses or um, there is a lot of different things uh, going on in the market. Resonant cavity as well, I've seen. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. They're promising and in the specific market in which this is needed, uh, we really need to go and, and search for that because otherwise we're not going to achieve it. And another big drive is the cost. Um, so a chip is not necessarily the best way to achieve a low cost. but there will be market, but there are different markets and different markets have, have different uh, requirements, mm. which means that yeah. there is no one winning technology, but there could be more. I understand. Thank you for the suggestions. <laughs> any other question? No. OK, please. Uh, Dorian, you, you can you can ask your question. We okay, we cannot hear you. Sorry. We are still not hearing the question. Sorry. Okay, I don't know. Maybe it was just. Type it. Type it okay, in the we'll chat. Ah, okay. We have another question by, by Sandro Scalise. Please, you can ask your question. 
Yeah, thank you and good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for this very interesting presentation, Sandra Scalise from DLR German Aerospace Center. I have actually two questions on the same slide where you were presenting your um, evolutions. Um, first of all, on the intersatellite links, you mentioned optic as technology, but you did not look too convinced. So is is this decided? Will the new generation have ISLs and will this be optic or RF is still an option? So what's, what's the status there? And the second, um, you were also mentioning 5G, but as far as I understood, this is going to be mostly backhauling. So you don't plan to have uh, new radio, 5G new radio waveform through your payloads. Did I got it correctly or was just a wrong understanding? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, um, on the first question is the optical or intersatellite thing in general to maximize our flexibility, we need to have intersatellite links. Um, so the target is to have it in the next generation. Now, the thing is that we haven't signed in blood anyway yet, yeah? so I cannot tell you if it's going to happen or not. There are different um, levels to it, but the target is certainly there and it, and it is for optics because it, it's more um, targeted to the capacity that we need. Um, so the target is to have optical intersatellite link, but we are not 100%, we haven't signed it yet. In terms of 5G, um, the development we are doing now is uh, for, yeah, backholing then what happens in the future nobody knows. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have another, another uh, question from uh, Michele Sala, please. Thank you, Sara, for the presentation. I'm Michele Sala mm -hmm. from uh, the automotive group of ST Microelectronics. And uh, uh, I would like to ask you, in your opinion, which is the, uh, the, the technology enable, enabler that is still missing for uh, allowing SATCOM reception on, uh, to be applicable on, uh, on standard cars? Okay, beside uh, the form factor of the antennas, are there any other points that you see uh, still, uh, still missing? Um. <clears throat> Mm, I don't think so. I mean, the, the 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 form factor and the power consumption are huge limits. Cause on a car, I mean, on a train, on a on a truck, I can put a fairly big antenna. On a car, not very much. Uh, it it needs to look nice as well, and that it's um, <laughs> it's going against. I think what is missing is the convin like still the 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 conviction both from the automotive uh, market and also from the space uh, bit that this market is something that is going to happen. Um, I think it will have to come from both sides. It will have to come from the user terminal side uh, in developing something that is quite uh, is appealing but maybe compromising in something and on the on the satellite side, it will have to compensate that compromise to make the market really happen. Yeah, I think I also have, I, I agree very a lot on this. Uh, I have a, a, a curiosity. So you put a, a radiation detector on, on the satellite. Yeah. So which radiation are, are you detecting? I mean? It's just uh, solar, solar or, or any other? Any, any kind. We just measuring, um, yeah, the, the, the level that we get in, uh, in a particular place um, and we'll make the data available to scientific community as well, because there is, we didn't find any, I mean, it was, it's impossible to find any data on Leo, on radiation in Leo. Um, to, to really design to the, to a level of radiation hardening that makes sense and is not an overshooting or an undershooting. But it's generally a te thermal, I mean, is uh, just a, for, for, for heating or you're also doing any uh, uh, RF monitoring, for example? 
RF as well, yeah. Ah, okay, so all, all radiation, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, because this is connected to um, another question. You mentioned that one web has a priority on the spectrum, yeah. and that's really interesting to know because uh, uh, I, I, I knew that geo generally as the priority. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Geo is the priority. Um, okay. As the priority, but geo is very geographic. Is is physically located in one place. So what a Leo satellite has to do is never basically transmitting when they are seven degree up and down of the equator. So we we have to skew the satellite and transmit with the satellite that are farther away. And when we cross the equator, the satellite switches off. And this is because we don't we cannot interfere with any user terminal which is looking at a geostationary orbit um, at the equator. But in any other place, which is not in that seven degrees, we have priority over any other LEO constellation so because obviously GEO is very directive. So I have to point at the satellite to get this, the, the signal. In LEO is a blanket capacity, so if there are two LEO systems on the same area, you will just simply get both of them. So the, the, the radiation detectors uh, is uh, to assure that you the, the, the priority is is, uh, is fulfilled. No, no, the radiation <laughs> detector. So we do measurements on ground. In Toulouse, we have done a campaign of measurement in the US as well. We do measurement campaign to make sure that the that other systems are not interfering with us. But the radiation detection on on the satellite is really to characterize the the, um, the, the space environment mm. for for designing for satellite design. Yeah, thank you very much. Any other? We are running a little bit late, so any mm. any other question? Okay, so if not. I will uh, thank you once more, uh, Sarah, for for the, for, uh, for this uh, very interesting seminar. It is recorded, so probably it will be seen by by many others also in the. I mean, it is on YouTube, so many, many people can students can can still use it as a document, uh, which is a, a really rel relative relevant one because it is made from 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 the industry, so it, that makes things happen for, for real. And uh, I'm really so I guess. Let's thank you again, and uh, let's thank all the speak, uh, all the the the, the audience uh, for 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 staying up up to up to almost uh, seven seven o'clock in the evening, and uh, it's six for me. No, no, but it, 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 everybody enjoyed that. I'm sure. So, okay, T thanks again, and and, uh, and good evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks bye for bye. inviting me. And yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye